good morning. morning. Welcome to worship at Acton Congregational Church. We are so glad that you're here with us this morning, whether you are present in the sanctuary or worshiping virtually. A special welcome to any first-time visitors. No matter who you are, whom you love, or where you are in your spiritual journey, you are welcome to join us as we seek to live God's love. My name is Barbara Skaggs, and I'm the welcoming deacon this morning. In addition to the many announcements in your bulletin, I'd like to highlight two offerings today. As always, our prayer team is available after the service to pray in confidence with you and for you. Also, our social justice task force will meet on Zoom immediately after the service to engage in exercises from the 21-day Racial Equity Habit Building Challenge and share reflections. All are welcome. The Zoom links were sent out this morning. Please also note that in recognition of Indigenous Peoples Day, the thrift shop will be closed tomorrow. The flowers on the communion table are given today by Bridget and Anthony Chamberis in dedication to Jennifer Beale and in loving memory of Peter Beale. And now, as we enter into the sacred time of worship, I invite you to open your hearts and minds to God. May our voices rise as one as we say together the prayer of the day printed in our bulletins. O oh God, you see all that we do. You are with us in every moment from our boring cry to our final breath. How can we answer your call? How can we live into the word you speak to us? We are weak. We are frail. We are imperfect. We burden our souls with our own failures and mistakes. We bog down our minds with unmet expectations for ourselves. Sometimes we seem unable to forgive ourselves. Sometimes we seem unable to admit that we are vulnerable. Yet your grace abounds. You know us better than we know ourselves. You see our shame and our guilt and in your mercy, you wash it away. You call us to live freely, courageously, and fearlessly, trusting in your grace. 
May we know your grace once again this morning, and may our hearts sing with gratitude. Amen. One of the definitions of stewardship is taking care of something, such as an organization or property, such as taking care of Acton Congregational Church. But let's turn that thought around for a moment and think about how ACC takes care of us. When I think of hard times I've gone through, or for that matter, happy times I've had, I think of the pastors or the friends I know at Acton Congregational. I think of meals provided, prayers lifted up, phone calls received, smiles and hugs. This church has provided so much support and love for me over the years, it's more than my aging brain can remember. Think of the church in your own family's life. Now turn the thought back around again. How can we take care of ACC as it does its work in our community and its work in the wider world? We can give of our time and our talents. We can give of our financial resources. We not only can, but we must. We are seeking to live God's love. Or as Anne Lamott says in one of her books, we are all just walking each other home. Our lesson today is from the book of Amos, chapter 5, verses 6 through 7 and 10 through 15. Listen for the word of God. Seek the Lord and live. 
or he will break out against the house of Joseph like fire. Ah, you that turn justice to wormwood and bring righteousness to the ground. They hate the one who reproves in the gate, and they abhor the one who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and take from them levies of grain, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and push aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, the prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, just as you have said. Hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word, and to his name be peace and glory. Amen. Here now a reading from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow, and is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since, then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the, th the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. O oh, holy God, may you bless us with your Holy Spirit in this time of worship. Open our hearts and open our ears, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. One of my preaching professors told me two things, not to use personal stories in sermons and not to ask rhetorical questions, but aren't rules made to be broken? Today is my son Cooper's first birthday. And the reason my professor told me not to use personal stories and sermons is because that first birthday means a whole lot to me, but probably not quite as much to many of you. And we always imbue our own personal stories with extra meaning that doesn't necessarily translate for others. But I found it hard to prepare for this sermon this week a task which demands a lot of reflection without 
thinking about this big moment in my life, in my family's life, in my son's life. And our scripture today tells us that the word of God is living and active. And so I decided I must listen to the word speaking through my life right now, the word that I hear through this important moment. And I hear that word in verse 13 of the fourth chapter of the letter to the Hebrews. Before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render account. This image brings me right back to the delivery room a year ago today when Cooper came into the world naked and laid bare. But after a long and difficult and sometimes scary labor, I too felt as if I were naked and laid bare. And in moments like that, we take a great risk. We take the risk of love, the risk of loving with all of our hearts and all of our souls something so fragile and vulnerable. And when we take that risk, we become vulnerable ourselves. I was just as vulnerable as that tiny grayish colored baby, more limp than I thought he would be, unable to cry because of fluid in his lungs and throat. A year later, we know this story has a happy ending, but before the nurses worked their magic, my entire being hung in the balance. And as I recount this story, my heart goes out, especially to all of those people, and perhaps some people listening today, whose worlds were shattered in delivery rooms like that. This is the risk of love, naked and laid bare. And it's a risk that God asks us to take. It's a risk that God takes as well. In Jesus, God, the one and holy creator, the divine being who formed the stars and galaxies from the chaotic stuff of the universe, the ground of all being, God becomes naked and laid bare. And each Christmas we sing the hymn, Away in a Manger, the cattle are lowing, the baby awakes, but little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. As Reverend Paulo pointed out last Advent, it's a little silly, this line, as if Jesus crying as a baby somehow diminishes his greatness or his divinity. And the important part of Jesus' birth, I always thought, was that God becomes human, which any parent can tell you includes some crying. But then my son was born and he was silent. I thought babies were supposed to cry the moment they were born. And a pang of terror seized my heart and I felt like an anchor was about to pull me through the floor. At the same time, I thought, what do I know about babies? Trust the nurses and let them do what they need to do. So they carried him, naked and laid bare, to a table in the corner of the room and got to work. And in that moment, Allie and I were like raw nerves, naked and laid bare, open to the world in the deepest and truest sense, where we felt completely powerless, like a feather blowing on the breeze, like a seashell caught in an ocean current. I don't remember the exact quantity of fluid they removed from his throat and lungs, but I remember they were surprised at how much it was. And finally, he made a tiny little noise, more of a whimper than a cry. And I'll never hear away in a manger the same way again. The author of the hymn intended to show Jesus' greatness, that Jesus wasn't like any other baby, that Jesus wasn't weak and vulnerable, naked and laid bare. But now all I think is that maybe baby Jesus had fluid in his lungs. Maybe he was grayish and limp and alarmingly quiet. And God, along with Mary and Joseph, knew true vulnerability, naked and laid bare, 
having taken the risk of love. A love that at any moment can pull our hearts down to the deepest depths of sorrow or lift us to the most sublime joys. We cannot truly love as God loves us without making ourselves vulnerable. But the entire course of human history can be marked as a long, desperate drive to move from a state of vulnerability to one of invulnerability. Vulnerability is viewed not as a natural state of being, but as a flaw, a bug in the system to be worked out, eliminated or eradicated. And we often have the false perception that humanity begins with the Neolithic revolution, the dawning of agriculture, which led to surpluses, then cities, then civilizations, which led to history and armies and markets and all the rest, which we today find synonymous with humanity. But we forget the truth that for hundreds of thousands of years, the vast majority of human existence was spent in a state of perpetual vulnerability in a literal wilderness, surrounded by constant threats. And only for the last 12,000 years or so have we had the luxury of deceiving ourselves of our natural vulnerability, as we learn to mitigate our risk of famine and disease and wild animal attack. It's true, some of our earliest biblical writers seem disproportionately concerned with being carried off by lions. But we forget that this was a distinct possibility and a serious threat. And to this day, our imaginations are captivated by dreams of invulnerability, from our natural desire to live longer lives to more radical possibilities that verge on science fiction like interplanetary colonization or uploaded consciousness. We are in a never-ending flight from vulnerability. And despite all our progress, we find ourselves still naked and laid bare, as powerless to control our futures and fates as a feather on a breeze. We try to escape vulnerability through the pursuit of invulnerability. We seek comfort and happiness and security to try to avoid the pain of vulnerability. We try to mitigate risk so as not to leave ourselves vulnerable to this pain and sadness and difficulty and suffering. But in doing so, we also mitigate the risk of love. We harden our hearts to the suffering of others, to the pain and injustice of the world, to the deep entangled web of hurt and regret that lies within us and in every person that we come across. We close ourselves off because to open our hearts to seven billion souls would be too much. A live wire, a raw nerve. This kind of vulnerable love, this God love, seems like madness. And this is why the people always thought the prophets were mad. Listen to the words of Amos, and you will hear the words of someone who has taken the risk of loving not just a child or a spouse or a family member or a friend, but all of God's people. To Amos, injustice isn't an unfortunate byproduct of a complex society. It's a direct and personal assault on a child of God. Amos lived during a time of great strength and power for the northern kingdom of Israel. And the people took pride in a golden age of art and architecture with beautiful music and luxurious goods. And Amos talks about beautiful beds of ivory and elegant couches and grand feasts and fine wines and oils. Israel felt strong. And the people, at least some of the people, were happy and comfortable and content momentarily free from that nagging feeling that would never go away of vulnerability. But does Amos see this as a time to rejoice? A time that God has blessed the people with power and riches? No! Amos rightly sees that this apparent time of strength and power is nothing more than a turn away from the open-hearted vulnerability 
and toward a hard-hearted dalliance with power, security, and denial. Amos sees that while the land is ostensibly flourishing, the poor are trampled and robbed, and injustice and unrighteousness rule. So here comes Amos, open-hearted and vulnerable, taking the risk of loving the people and paying the price for it. He's an angry poet, affronted and besieged by the horrible crimes he sees perpetrated against God's children, by God's children. And the suffering that he witnesses breaks his heart, and he cannot keep silent. So he calls on the people to repent, to seek God and live. And by and large, he is laughed off, disregarded, and disgraced. The nation courts the allure of invulnerability, pursuing power, power, comfort, and security, and turning its back on the people in need. Because that way of vulnerability is painful and unpleasant. The nation turns its back on God and embraces an easy idolatry that worships hedonism and happiness, comfort and security, wealth and power. Well, there's a reason Amos is a prophet. He has vision and insight and he speaks the truth. And before long, the empire of Assyria shatters the illusion of invulnerability, destroying cities, villages, and temples, reducing the entire nation to rubble from which it would never return. This is how the northern kingdom of Israel, called Samaria, was destroyed once and for all. And this reveals the beautiful paradox at the heart of the Christian faith. Only through an embrace of vulnerability, the risk of love that leads to the cross will you achieve life, true life, everlasting. To court invulnerability leads to destruction. Seek the Lord and live, Amos says. Seek good and not evil that you may live. If we want to live, if we want to really live the way God calls us to live and intends for us to live, if we really seek true life in Christ, then we must take the risk of love. And we cannot do so without embracing an open-hearted vulnerability, a pathos that feels the suffering of the people, that rages against injustice and braves the depths of pain and sadness. We live in a world that sees vulnerability as weakness, that sees our true selves underneath it all as shameful. But if we want to live, we must shed our armor, drop our defenses, and embrace our true vulnerability, naked and laid bare. We must put on our birthday suits. Brothers and sisters and siblings, these are the clothes God gave us because God loves us. We don't need to hide or cover up. Take off all of your spiritual pads and armor. Take off your makeup and sunglasses. Take it all off and approach the throne of grace with boldness, naked as we came, wearing our birthday suits proudly, and say, here I am, God, in all my weakness, with all my faults, and I'm here to receive mercy and find grace so that I can live a new life in Christ, so that I can really live. Say, I'm ready to take the great risk of love, knowing full well that it is not easy or comfortable, knowing full well that there will be pain and sorrow and fear and failure. Say, I'm ready to take the risk of love, trusting that you will watch over my coming out and my going in, trusting that you will not let my foot be moved, trusting that in Jesus Christ you have given us a Savior who Hebrews tells us is able to sympathize with our weakness, who has himself been tested, who has been naked and laid bare, who has suffered and died, and who has triumphed in the glory of resurrection, testifying once and for all 
that an open-hearted, vulnerable, naked love for all of God's children is the gateway to true life. The risk of love is not a win-lose proposition. When we take the risk of love, when we make that leap of faith, we will find a deep, abiding joy, a life of meaning and purpose, a path of redemption and reconciliation with our Creator as well as with ourselves and all others. So this day, I pray that you go forth exposed, open-hearted, vulnerable. Go forth in your birthday suits and live like it's your birthday party. Embrace your vulnerability. Take the risk of love and find true life and deep joy. Amen. This is a time when we pray together as a community of faith. And during this time, I invite you to lift up your own prayers before God. Let us pray together. God of many names and infinite love, we turn to you in this sacred moment of prayer, hoping to find healing, mercy, strength, guidance, and peace in your holy presence. We praise you, O God, for bringing us into this time of worship, where we give thanks for life, for the beauty of your creation, for the mandate to love our neighbors, and for Christ, 
our high priest, our teacher, our prophet, our Lord and Savior, who removes the heavy yoke off our shoulders and blesses us with the burden of faith. We know, God, that we are poorly equipped to practice kindness, love justice, and walk humbly with you. So deepen in us the desire to be more like Jesus, the founder of the church. Be patient with us. Ease us into being Christians, not only in our minds, but especially in our hearts, souls, and in the way we treat each other. Loving God as we pause to pray, we are mindful of the troubles and sufferings of our world. Today we lift before you world leaders, our elected officials, the United Nations, and all who are in positions of power and can make a difference. We ask that they may see the insanity of our global socioeconomic system that it still insists on sacrificing the earth, its resources, the poor, and the middle class to stuff the already well-stuffed pockets of the one percenters. May we find a better and more beautiful way to live together and protect your creation, O oh God. We pray for migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers throughout the world. Stretch our capacity to love them as Christ loves us. We pray for people living in the shadows of death. Have mercy, O oh loving God, on all those who are still unable to be vaccinated against COVID-19 around the world. Bring peace and aid to the people of Yemen and Afghanistan who are facing the worst humanitarian crisis in their lifetime. Empower us, your church, to make your justice roll down like a roaring stream and your peace flow like a river throughout the earth until humankind can live up to our noblest dreams and most beautiful values. Holy One, maker of all human beings, we pray this morning for the wisdom to honor the histories, cultures, religions, and humanities of our indigenous neighbors. Lead our society in the way of reconciliation with all of those whom we have hurt and abused. Give us the same heart and mind that was in Christ, so we can clearly see and embrace the dignity of every human being. Physician of our souls, incline your ears to our prayers as we lift up friends and members of our church for your blessing. Gay Rose, Lynn Vance and her family, Lou Fino, John and Ruth, Helen, Jim, Ibit, Zachary, Dawn and her family as they mourn the death of a beloved father. Merciful God, because we are yours, in silence, we make our secret petitions and supplications known to you. ever-present God, be with us throughout this week. Open our eyes so we may see the light of Christ around us, in us, and in others. And encourage all of us to live into the hope of your kingdom as we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, in this holy gathering, we learn to be vulnerable before each other. We learn to open our hearts up to God and bring to God our prayers. We learn to be truly and fully human as God created us to be. And so I invite you to support the ministries of this church, this ministry that invites us to trust one another, to trust that God speaks through us and to us as we gather in community, to believe that we can be vulnerable and safe in this holy place. Your morning offering will now be received. bless our giving and our gifts, empower us to love our neighbors with the fierce love of Christ, give us wisdom to use this offering to unlock hearts and move minds for solidarity, for justice, for hope, for peace, for Christ, for your saving love. In Christ and through Christ we pray, amen.
My friends, go forth from this place naked and laid bare, embracing your weakness and your vulnerability, wearing your birthday suits, and know true love and true joy. Maybe this week that looks like dancing like no one's looking, like singing proudly off key at the top of your lungs. Maybe it looks like admitting that it's me, O oh Lord, standing in need of prayer and asking someone to pray for you. Maybe it looks like offering a prayer for someone even though you don't quite know what to say. So go forth this place and take that risk of love. Go forth and may God, your creator who has made you wonderfully bless you. Go forth blessed by Jesus, the son who sympathizes with you, who knows what it is like to be human. And go forth inspired by the Holy Spirit that gives you the power and the strength and the courage to transform and become who God is calling you to be. Go in peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.